began to think there are a number of places where I would draw this distinction inside the Jewish family between commitments and transgression. And um, one of them would be the notion of how we are asking the same person and the same relationship to be the space in which we can experience freedom and security, independence and connection, separateness and togetherness, this duality like that. And all of us will come out of our childhood, by the way, some of us needing more space and some of us needing more protection. And typically, we will mate with somebody whose proclivities will match our vulnerabilities. So when I look at a couple first, because you need a couple to have a family, um, all kinds of couples, heterosexual couples, gay couples, but all couples, when coming together today, are trying to straddle this model where we want to experience the security and the freedom at the same time. When we think of Jewish, most of the people I talk to associate the Jewish with the security. When they date, it's not Jewish they're dating. It's freedom they're dating, and that doesn't associate with Jewish. That's associated with the larger culture. Call it America and everything else that has to do with 21st century culture. So when does Jewish become relevant again? When we need more security. When do we need more security again? When we become family. Basically, when the little Schmurfs arrive. The Schmurfs? You know the Schmurfs? The children, the children. You know. So I'm going to lead us to that. But I'm thinking here, you know, um, when I, the irony, of course, when you think about, um, when you think about the arrival of the, of the kids is that um, from a family perspective, um, marital satisfaction plummets with the arrival of the children. <laughs> Individual people are happy, but the marriage actually takes a bit of a dive. Um, primarily because um, all the resources are redirected and reorganized. So sex makes babies, and babies often spell erotic disasters in couples. And not on the sexual front only, but on the aliveness of the couple. But when you begin to, have to think about children, basically you start to think that you need to become their security and their anchor so that they can fly, so that they can be transgressive, so that they can break the rules, so that they can be exploratory, so that they can go and discover. And so, you know, it starts even long before pregnancy when people decide it's time to stop smoking and to sell their motorcycle and to have their fridge with more than a six pack. And there's a whole kind of preparation by which we become more secure, by which we become more committed to the certainty aspect of life because children are enough of an uncertainty in our life. And um, they are these wonderful creatures who give tremendous joy but can also put us in states of terror that are unmatched. So we commit ourselves to them, we commit to becoming their secure base, and we want them to be the ones to fly. What starts to happen in the family often is that two things take place. It's not that the energy is sapped per se, it's that the energy gets redirected. The erotic energy gets redirected onto the kids. The kids get the languorous hugs, the kids get the play dates, the kids get the new clothes, the adults walk around in sweatpants, you can't remember the original color, the adults <laughs> go out on a date twice a year for the anniversary and the birthday, the kids get to do the novelty and the exploration and the time out latest and the parents often do the same old and same old, and they become a comfortable sofa, and the kids become the exciting edge. And the erotic energy is alive and well, but it's eros redirected. And then the family becomes more and more of the security, 
And then people often start to long for that other part of them, for the lost parts of themselves that used to connect them with a sense of aliveness and vitality and all of that other energy. And so by definition, we continuously need to look at how we can bring these two together, reconcile them in some way, in a very imbalanced way, because the balance changes all the time. You know, if family life thrives on consistency, on routine, and on repetition, basically playfulness is about mystery, novelty, the unknown, the unexpected, the surprise. It's the opposite. On some level, one could say that um, what eroticism thrives on is what family life defends against. Now, the same thing happens with the Jewish family, and the same thing happens also with the Jewish community, is that very often there's a kind of a split that takes place between um, what you should and what you want, where you experience duty and obligation, and where you experience personal fulfillment. Um, Hebrew school is duty and obligation for many people. The soccer game is personal fulfillment for other people. It's very basic, you know, and the parents will straddle that with their children too. Should I force you to go and do the thing that you should do? Or I don't want you to be unhappy because your friends are going there and so I'm going to just let you go and play the game. Um, we, you know, used to um, apropos commitment and transgression, the other very interesting thing, very, very much connected to that, um, which is completely different from the way Jews have raised their children for millennia, for millennia, um, is that um, this notion of happiness doesn't just belong to adults. We are completely obsessed with wanting our children to be happy. Never in the history of humankind, when you ask parents, what do you want for your kids, has their first answer been, I want them to be happy. For way too long, the first answer was, I want them to live. Then it was about, I want them to be good people. But not, I want them to never feel bad and to be happy. And once you set up that program, you create a form of child rearing that makes it much less likely for people to do that what a religion and a community and a culture expects from you, which is to do what's right, regardless of if you like it or not or to do what's expected of you, regardless of if you like it or if it's convenient to you or not. So we have actually, we are experiencing often a kind of a, um, a break, a tension inside of us. Parts of us are very much still wedded and committed to the Jewish values, but a major other part of us inside our own Jewish family is as American as can be. We ask a two-year-old to tell us what they want to eat and where they want to sleep and what they want to wear because we believe that it is part of what will make them become good autonomous ad adults later on who know exactly what they want. Well, then they will know what they want, but that doesn't mean that they will be connected to what other people expect from them. So we are raising children for autonomy and for independence and for freedom. We are not raising children for loyalty and for interdependence and for group connectedness. So inside the Jewish family is a little um, theater going on between commitment and transgressions. You follow me? Good. <laughs> when you think about commitment and transgression around that thing around the children, you have a notion that is, I will give my children the best of what I know and the best of what we know about the traditions, about the beliefs, about the practices, and the belief is this, if you let the kid free, then the kid will choose freely. It's just that it may not be the choice you would have wanted, but if you believe in the free choice enterprise, I leave you free and maybe then you come back. It's also what people do in adult relationships, that dance of how much I leave you free so that I actually trust that you really want to come back because nobody wants somebody today that is just there because they have to. We are living in the realm of desire and in the realm of desire or the era of desire, which is the 
prime individualistic um, notion, it's to own the wanting. Desire is to own the wanting. Desire is the fundamental freedom that what I do is the thing that I want to do. If I take it to the realm of sexuality, where I spend a lot of time these days, this is the first time in the history of humankind that we are not having sex because we want eight children in the West, for which we need a 12, because four were not going to live anyway. And it's the first time in our history that we're not having a sexual model that is a duty model. We have a model that is totally rooted in desire and pleasure and connection. We have it because we want to. And I want you to want, I don't want you to do it for me just to do me a favor. That was the old guy. The new guy, he wants her to want. And she wants him to make her want. And everybody's in this wanting business. You know? But it is fundamental. Because if the wanting dies, if the desire dies, sometimes the love isn't big enough to sustain the family. People don't just leave each other because they stop loving each other. They leave each other because they don't want each other enough. They don't desire each other enough. That is a whole new level of dealing with commitment and transgression. The fact that one doesn't desire may trump even if I love you deeply. But my not desiring you, when I get to that fundamental new stage we have today called midlife, where we say, is this it? Is there more? Is it going to be like that for the next 25 years? Then we go into forms of transgression, meaning we break our own rules of whatever commitments we made in order to not think frivolously, I'm right, I'm, I'm entitled to be happy, but in order to think deeply about the, I could be happier. I may not even be miserable, but I could be happier. And all of these tensions are playing each of themselves out inside the Jewish family. So, now that I have given you the lay of the land about this um, gener yes, I'm saying, the generation that has been commitment and transgression is being challenged by the children, and how do we go about navigating this? I think that the, 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 the thing that calms me down, right, when I get anxious about all of this, which I do, um, is that I fundamentally believe in this notion that we need, that we all have two fundamental sets of human needs, but they spring from different sources and they pull us in different directions. But I do believe like all epic stories, that we need home and journey. That even, when, that, the, that even the people who stand completely claiming freedom need security. And that the people who are completely into the safe, stable, predictable, actually long to reach out and to open up and to reach out. And that's part of why they mate with the others. And once I have that in mind, then um, I go back and forth according to situation. It depends if it's vis-a-vis -vis myself or vis-a-vis -vis the children or vis-a-vis um, -vis my partner, for that matter. But, you, you know, it's, it's to not believe what you see. The people who are very, very free need anchoring, and the people who are too anchored need movement. A body cannot be static. It needs stillness and it needs movement. Music needs silence and it needs sound. That kind of duality is something that I, I, I fundamentally watch all the time. So um, many times, you know, you, you guess wrong kind of thing, but you know that if you've stayed too long on one side, you go back to the other, you know. Um, and as a concrete example, um, when I think, uh, let's go to kids, when I think that, my, that there's something that I, when my children ask me something, you know, I'm a family therapist, huh? sometimes I'm like, ah, why, what is, uh, I start to ask questions. And realized, finally, I said, no, I will tell them what I think. And then they're not happy. 
And then I decided that's not too bad, you know? Then they will be more resilient if they know not to be happy. And I will just continue to say, you're not happy, but this is what it will be. And for a while, I had a knot about that. Oh, but they will be frustrated in their self-esteem and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I actually slowly kind of went back to this notion of it's okay. Somebody once in a while needs to know. Not everything is a constant exploration because that becomes too dizzying. Then I go back to the other side. You know, I'm the mother who works on sex, so, how, you know, she's a, that, that, that for two teenage boys, you can imagine, you know. <laughs> <sighs> Surround yourself so that you can talk about it. And that is missing because we are way too busy doing and reacting, and most of us do not have nearly enough time to just think about it for a minute and take it in and ponder it, and especially not with the people we live with. We will find time for others, but the ones we live with are the ones we actually talk the least with. And that, I think, is really missing. So that's just, it's, it's more philosophical than technique, this thing. This thing, this straddling question you're asking me, my best answer for you is this. It is a paradox that you manage and not a problem that you solve. Do you understand me? may not be very American because I know you all believe that there is a solution to everything. <laughs> you know, there's no problem that you can't do something about it. It's a lot of doing, but it's a kind of doing that manages the paradox, not that solves the problem. It's existential. It's just that it's been brought up to a level that um, most eras were either on one side or the other. They have never brought it to like that together within one couple, certainly not within the couple that we want the same person to be the source of surprise and adventure and the source of stability and safety, that is an utter extraordinary invention. Yes, a microphone. The question about what happens when, um, um, when women out-earn men or what happens in gender relation when um, the economic distribution of the family changes. I would like to say that um, differently. I think there is an amazing invention that took place in modern family and postmodern family, which is not often talked about enough. It's the invention of fatherhood. The, the invention of fatherhood, the transition from the father as an economic unit to the father as an emotional unit, is one of the most amazing shifts that has taken place. You cannot look at women working and out earning men without putting the other one into the equation. There are two changes that took place. The fathers became an emotional unit and the children became a creature of meaning. Children used to give us work, today they give us meaning. And, there is, and the sentimental idealization around the children is that they will tell us if we have been good parents. So, in that context, I think that the flexibility model that I think is really where we're going and the fluidity model is one in which a family probably would be much better off if it organized itself around people's competencies and passions rather than just around traditional gender roles. There are a lot of women who are much better at doing business than at being empathic, loving mothers in the house, creatures. They go crazy in that zone. And there are a lot of dads who are extraordinary at caretaking and at doing all kinds of value addition, even financial value addition that doesn't just correspond to the narrow definition of a paycheck. That's a short answer. So, what do I say to a bunch of wild people who are finally, <laughs> who, are, who are wanting to become a little bit more serious, but not too serious, because then they will feel like they've become a squeezed lemon. Okay. <laughs> That's, is that a, do I capture it? Okay. <laughs> um, I think that the, the, the thing, for me, that I, I actually spend a lot of time with millennials. It's, uh, it's the crowd I, I like to hang out with, you know? So I do summit series and all of those things. And, um, oh, I need to talk in this thing. And um, I think 
you are, if I may say, you are a generation that um, three things I would say on the top of my head. One is you are a generation who still no different from anyone else wants a committed relationship and the comforts of that committed relationship. But you are less willing than the generations preceding to lose all the freedoms that go along with it. And therefore, you are going to be more creative than the ones that came before you. And you're going to be creative in varieties of ways, including this one. We will organize the family according to um, the competencies and the passions, and not just according to the gender roles. You, you know, will have all kinds of ways to deal with long distance relationships and commute, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I be, and we, you're going to negotiate monogamy very differently than the generations preceding that too. And you're going to negotiate privacy and transparency quite differently, which are, you know, we live in the era of transparency, and, but I think you're going to negotiate that one differently from the ones preceding you as well. But you're going to have to struggle with your FOMO phenomenon, <laughs> you know, because you are constantly thinking, like good consumers of a, you know, that market economy, that you can do better. And in that I can do better, you are going to sometimes sit later on and regret something that was very good, but you were just caught in that thing of I can do better. And um, you also straddle something that's very new for me, which is that I always thought that a good relationship was a place from which I could launch and do all kinds of things. I never thought of an intimate relationship as a place that constrains me. You think of relationships as a place that deprives you of your freedom. And that is too bad. You don't see how it can bolster you, how it can nurture you, how it can inspire you and give you confidence. You see more how it holds you back. Uh, you have more trust in an MBA than in a relationship. <laughs> and that's because you are the children of the divorced and the children of the disillusioned. And so you are right sometimes to have more trust. but. Love is an inescapable thing that all of us want to taste no matter what, so you will throw yourself into it. Beautiful question. Um, if a couple without the kids is trying to straddle commitment and freedom, can they do it simultaneously, or, um, or did, and how do they get their biorhythms in check? Um, here is the way I would draw this for you. I'm actually going to draw it for you starting when we are very little, OK? But translate it all the time in adult version, OK? I got to move. The little kid sits here on your lap, OK? At the beginning, if all goes well, comfortably, nested. And at some point, if all goes well in the evolution of humankind, the little Schmurf jumps off and goes into the world to explore, to discover, to enter their imaginary world, to play, to be free. That is what we do. And every little kid looks back to the adult and waits to see what they're going to say. And if the adult says, kiddo, the world's a great place. Go, play, have fun. I'm here. What does the child do? turns back and goes further and experiences in that most synchronized, unconflicted way, freedom and connection, security and adventure, togetherness and separateness. And when they're done, they come back and they plot themselves again. But if the adult here says, I'm miserable, I'm depressed, I'm lonely, I'm anxious, my parent has, my partner, pardon, hasn't paid attention to me in whatever the amount of time. But basically, the messages say, come back. As in, don't we have so good here? Why do you need to go there? Take care of me. Then many children, there are three main responses, but I'll give you the main one for your question. The first group of kids are the ones who will come back. And in order not to lose you, I will lose a part of me. And I'll forego freedom to secure connection. 
That's the adult who says, again, you have to go out. Again, you need to go with your friends, and then you go play golf, again you this, again you that, versus the adult that says, have a great time. I can't wait to hear you tell me later. You know, why don't you stay a couple more days? You know, you never get to go there. <laughs> but not as in good riddance, but as in you like to go there. You haven't been to Paris in so long. You know, take another two days. It's that generosity that says, when you're happy, it makes me feel good. And not when you get, it takes away from me. So couples who straddle this thing well are couples where there is a tremendous respect for the individuality of the other person. And the key word that often goes with that is actually not love and not closeness or even not respect or not freedom, it's admiration. Because admiration emphasizes otherness. And in a couple that straddles security and freedom, there needs to be a kind of sense of otherness, that you really see who this other one is. They're different from you. They do different things. They like different things. But they then come back because you like to come back to a place that lets you leave. Many couples because they become anxious because of the whole psychology of why some people need more security and safety, end up creating, instead of intimacy, because intimacy for me is really that two-ness, they create surveillance systems. That's very different. Surveillance systems. Where have you been? What did you do? Who did you talk to? What did you eat? As if that tells me anything about you. But for some strange reason, it makes me feel like it's not control. It's about protection and safety. But it's control mechanisms to, to increase the security rather than trust. Surveillance never replaces trust. In a system where people have that to something, there is a lot of trust. Now, there are periods where you do more of the security and less of the freedom. When you have young kids, for, for example, when one person is with ailing parents. When the system needs centrifugal force, you can't play in the same way. But when the tide is low, more differentiation, the better. You don't need to do it simultaneously either for that matter. You just need to recognize the need of the other. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to Jam, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.